we were, uh, were able to come into a, a house of worship and, and uh, sing praises and <clears throat> enjoy uh, our fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ and, and, uh, and know that uh, God is with us because he tells us where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. So he's here. He's here, and, and he is involved in our lives, and, in, and, uh, and he says that he, he lives in us and, and through the Holy Spirit and guides us and leads us. Um, Pastor Rudy asked me a, a, few, a couple of weeks ago if, if I would come and, and preach in his absence one Sunday, and, and I, I kind of looked at him, and I said, are you willing to take that chance? <laughs> he says, I trust you, brother. I said, I said okay. So uh, uh, today I want to share with you <clears throat> out of the Gospel of John uh, at chapter 15, and uh, we'll, we'll look at a few verses here and, and, uh, and try to make some comments on them and, and share with you and, 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 and try to keep it relevant. And uh, um, in the beginning here, in, in the verses uh, 1 through 5, um, Jesus is comparing our relationship with him to a grapevine and the branches of that vine. Just as the branches need to be connected to the vine to, to maintain life, we as Christians and followers of Christ must remain connected to Jesus for life. Here in uh, John chapter 15, G Jesus gives us some life application for maintaining our relationship with the Lord. You know, and I think that is something that we have to work on uh, minute by minute, with me especially. I, ha I have to r maintain my focus on who God is and who I am and who, my, who the people are around me. And uh, so with these verses in, in uh, uh, chapter 15, Jesus speaks to us uh, through his words as he was speaking to the apostles in that day. Uh, I want to read the first five verses, and then we'll go on. The, the, the passages we'll use for the message this morning, though, is from 6 to 14, but I want to read the first five. Uh, they're relevant. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Let's pray. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, as we, as we come before your throne this morning and we uh, are anxious about a lot of things and thinking about a lot of things and, and concerned about different things in our lives, we want to uh, kind of open our hearts and open our ears and listen to your word today and, and let it sink into our hearts and and be more attentive to who you are in our lives and who we are in your, in your life. Father, we, uh, we just thank you for this opportunity to share today. We thank you for our pastor and, and his family, and we pray for them that as they are uh, taking this time of rest and, and rejuvenation, we pray that you just fill them with your spirit and give them that peace and comfort and let them know that you are in control and that you will bless them and provide for them and give them rest that they need. That they may be prepared and ready and willing to come back and, and serve to the fullest. And Father, as, as I preach and, and speak here today, I pray for clarity of thought and words that I may be understood and that the hearers here might attain to your words and receive them with joy and happiness, that we may go from this place today different, not indifferent, but different, that we may receive a word from you 
that will fill us with your joy, with your courage, with your boldness, with your spirit, that we might reach out to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we see in the first five verses here, Jesus is describing our relationship with him. An uh, 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 intricate relationship, an uh, intertwined relationship, a relationship that must uh, rely on one another. Now, Jesus doesn't have to rely on us. No, he doesn't. But he does, in a sense, to rely on us to carry out the mission. You know, we are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Uh, Jesus is the head. He is the leader. And we are to submit to him and be the body, be the feet, be the hands, be the mouths, be the ears, and do what we have been called to do, which is bear fruit. All right. We're going to get into this and, and looking at uh, what we're talking about here is that relationship and maintaining the right kind of relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> First of all, he describes that relationship in verses 1 through 5. And then in verse 6, where we'll pick up our text today that we'll be sharing on, verse 6, we see something change. He says in verse 6, If a man abide not in me. If a man abide not in me. Okay, well, that's a little different than abiding in. That's being uh, uh, taken away from. So as I look at that, I, think of, I was thinking about this, and I'm thinking, well, this is a collapse of the relationship. The relationship has fallen apart for some reason. And the collapse of the relationship is due to a lack of nurture. As we look at it in verse 6, it goes on to say, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. In other words, he's taken away. He, he's cast himself away most of the times, and he begins to wither. As we see this, we see a collapse from lack of nurture. And, and in that, we see <clears throat> the word abiding. Uh, in verses 1 through 5 to 6, we, we see that word abiding. And that uh, word abide or abiding means to stay in, in that, uh, to, to uh, live in. And it has the, the real sense of living inside. So in other words, he's saying we must live in him. Live in him in he, as he lives in us and abides in us. And here, here's one who has not abided in him. Here is one, uh, it says in verse 6, that if a man abide not in me, he is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. A collapse of relationship. A relationship that has, has no nurture. A relationship that has not been sustained. If a man abide not in me, uh, that word is, you, is translated from the Greek minnow, which means to stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. So in essence, what Jesus is saying here is that if a man does not stay in a right relationship with him, the man is cast forth as a branch. Cast forth as a withered branch. Disconnected from the vine. Disconnected from the trunk. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, he is cast forth as a branch. This Severed relationship withers and dies. In this phrase, the word forth has a, the meaning uh, out or outside, cast forth. Jesus says that says four things happen to a man that is cast out. The first is and withered, is and withered, which is to dry up or shrivel up. And when a plant limb is dried up, it is dead and very flammable. There's no moisture in it. The sap is gone. So you see, for us to maintain a vibrant life, Christian life, we must be connected to the branch that the sap can flow. That sap from Jesus has to flow in and out of us. He tells us in the, in the scripture that we must uh, uh, let the living waters flow out of our bellies. A flowing water, flowing sap. You know, whenever water gets uh, backed up and stagnant, it kind of begins to smell, and it, it begins to grow little mosquito larvae in it. We call them wiggle worms, and they're just wiggling around in there, and it's bad water. You can't drink it. You can't do anything with it. It's stagnant. So the same with the, the sap not flowing through the branch. It begins to wither, and it dies, and it's cast out. 
put aside and it's cast forth. It's, it, it's, it's set up for destruction. So we see the collapse from lack of nurture and we see the collapse of the fellowship beginning in the middle part of verse 6. He says, and is with it, and men gather them and cast them into the fire. The collapse of fellowship. Fellowship is cast into the fire of ridicule. Secondly, the second thing of the four Jesus is talking about, he said that men gather them. He didn't say God gathered them. He didn't say angels gathered them. He said men gathered them are kind of like being turned over to them for punishment. One of the worst things that could happen to a professing Christian is to stumble, fall, and be gathered up by worldly men. When this happens, the third thing Jesus says takes place and cast them into the fire. They're cast into the fire of ridicule and shame by which they are burned. This is the final thing Jesus says would happen to them. They're burned. So we, we see what happens from the lack of nurture here. We see that collapse of relationship. The relationship falls apart and there's no fellowship. And it just dries and is burned, cast forth. And we need to uh, look at this in our own lives. How connected are we? Are we connected? Is the sap flowing? Is Jesus' words flowing in and through us? To others. That's the way it's, it's meant to be. <clears throat> so we need to be connected and let the sap flow. Fellowship is burned by the, by the scorn of the world. Whenever we have a broken fellowship with Jesus Christ, we are ridiculed by the worldly people, by people who do not know Christ. They don't understand. And that fellowship is burnt. Not consumed yet, but burnt. <clears throat> Commitment of the relationship. Let's go to verse 7. If you abide in me, here he brings it back to abiding, living in, staying within Jesus Christ, connected to the branch, connected to, uh, the, connected to the vine, not the branch. The branch is connected to the vine. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Here, Jesus has given us the commitment of the relationship. We must commit ourselves to abiding in him. Make that commitment. He showed us what's going to happen if we don't maintain that relationship, if we don't nurture that relationship. Now he's showing us what we need to do to maintain that relationship. He says, com the, uh, commit. Commit to nurture. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you, done for you, or done unto you. Nurture brings oneness to, to the relationship. If you abide in me, or in other words, keep your hearts and minds in his, Jesus, realm of conducting life, and my words abide in you, if we stay in that sphere of what he has told us to do. Stay inside of the commands and the, and the words that Jesus has given us. Stay inside of those teachings. Fruitfulness proves to whom we are. Fruitfulness proves to whom we belong. Continuing in verse 8. And when we bring glory to God, this proves our... Excuse me, I've jumped down too far. Nurture opens a line of communication. We shall ask what we want. Uh, back to verse 7. I jumped to verse 8 too quick. Excuse me. Um, it says, You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. Jesus has, has told us in his word several times this very phrase. Ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. And, you know, and I think uh, that as believers in Jesus Christ, and we have committed ourselves to him, and we abide in him, and we are looking for his direction and looking for his purpose in our lives, what we ask and what we pray is going to align with his will. Our will will align with his will. And whenever our wills are aligned and we begin to pray in a, in a manner that will bring honor and glory to the Father, you're going to get it. You're going to get what you want. You're going to get what you need because what you need is in line with what God wants in your life. So, looking at that, we say, uh, the nurture opens a line of communication. Ye shall ask what ye will. We ask 
We can ask him for whatever we will. If we have done what he uh, has said to do this far, his will should be our will, and it shall be done unto you. Our will aligns with his will. Um, verse 7, and it shall be done to you. Verse 8, Commit, committing, commitment brings fruitfulness. Commitment brings fruitfulness. Look at this, verse 8. And this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Up in, up in verse 5, he was talking about bearing fruit. And then he's, he's bearing more fruit. And now we're talking about bearing much fruit. Bearing fruit is, is evidence of the tree or the vine. Whatever fruit you bear, people can tell what tree you are. If you're of Christ, you're going to bear Christ's likeness. If you're of the world, you're going to be bear worldly likeness. You, you understand? It's just the law of the farmer. Whatever you plant, that's what you're going to grow. If you plant a bean, you're not going to grow corn. If you plant corn, you're not going to get an apple. It's just not going to happen. Whatever you plant, that's what's going to grow. Same thing here. Whatever, what fruit we bear is what tree we are connected to. And if we're connected to Christ, we're going to bear the fruit of Christ. Commitment brings fruitfulness. Fruitfulness glorifies God. So if you want to glorify God, be fruitful. If you want to glorify God, produce some fruit in your life. Okay? Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. The product of our life in Christ glorifies God. So if we would like to honor God, we can do that by being productive Christians. Fruitfulness proves to whom we belong. And when we bring glory to God, this proves our relationship to Jesus. So that you may be my disciples. See that in, in the latter part of verse 8? Last phrase. So that you may be my disciples. So the proof of our relationship to Jesus is in the product of our life in Christ. Again, I say, let's examine ourselves. Isn't that what Paul said? Examine yourselves that you may prove yourself in the faith. We need to take some self-examination. I kind of take mine about every 15 minutes. Because, you know, you know I'm, I'm human. I'm still in this flesh. And things happen and, and circumstances take place and and they just bombard you from all directions. And before you know it, you're thinking and, and, and maybe even saying some of the stuff you shouldn't be saying or thinking. So we have to examine ourselves. Make sure we may remain connected and allowing the juices and the sap to flow. The commitment brings fruitfulness. All right? So here we go. Verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you, continue you, continue you in my love. All right, here it is. This is the commandment. This is what Jesus said. He told us back in, in, the, in the book of Matthew. Way back here in, in the book of Matthew. Right here somewhere. I got it. Listen to this. Matthew 22 and verse 37. Jesus was being questioned <clears throat> by the lawyer Pharisees. He was being asked some questions. And he says, the, the Pharisee says, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which is the greatest? Jesus says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul and with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Heart soul, and mind, all that you have. And the second is likened to that, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And, th and then he says something right here that is phenomenal. This last little sentence. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus did not come to take away the law and prophets, he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And he fulfilled that law on the cross out of love. 
He went to the cross and, and fulfilled every law and every proverb of the prophets. He fulfilled them on that cross for our sakes. We don't have to worry about the law of Moses. All we have to worry about is the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ, you might ask? The law of Christ is love. That's it. That the law of Christ is loving God with all that you have and all that you are and loving your neighbor like yourself. If you can do those two things, if you can hang on to those two things, you can fulfill all the law and all the prophets. It's, it's glorious to know that we don't have to get up every morning and try to bring a sacrifice. We don't have to get up and do all these penances and, and do all these sayings and carry out all this ritual. All we have to do is get up and love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. The commandment of the relationship. The commandments of the relationship are explained in the, these following verses. Jesus first gives us an example of his commands. Then he demonstrates to us how to implement them. <laughs> commands exemplified here's the here's the example first of all in verse 9 let me get back there wrong wrong page verse 9 as the father hath loved me so have i loved you as the father has loved me so have i loved you you shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So here Jesus is, is giving the example of how the love is supposed to work. Just as Jesus was obedient to the death, Jesus was obedient to the Father. Remember in the garden when the, uh, the, the, the three apostles fell asleep on the watch and and Jesus went out a little further and he prayed three times. And he prayed and he prayed and, and he prayed with such anguish and agony that great uh, drops of sweat like blood came from his face. And he was praying before God and, and right here is where the defeat for Satan was. Right here is where our salvation began. Right here when Jesus said, Father, take this cup from me. But not as I will, but as you will. You see, Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. Him being fully God knew exactly what was going to take place. He knew he was going to be beaten with a cat of nine tails. He knew he was going to be shred apart with that thing. He knew that he was going to be nailed to a cross and hung there to die. He knew all that. He knew the anguish. And that's why he was in such anguish in the garden. And he said, Father, not as I will, but what you will be done. You see, when, when we come to exemplify that kind of love, when we begin, begin to, to look at this example of the Father's love that he has for me and the love that I have for the Father, this gives us the answer to what fruit Christians are to produce. That fruit would be love, unconditional love unsurpassed love only kind of love you can give like that is the love that God gives you you cannot love others like Christ loves unless he is in you unless he is abiding in you unless you're connected to the to the to the vine you can't do it it's not going to happen the world does not know love oh they talk about love they talk about all kinds of love but they don't know the author of love. They don't know the God of love. The Bible says that God, that John says it in the latter, in the little books of John, he says, for God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. God is the essence of love. So we must remain connected. We must stay connected to that vine. And for the sap to flow, for the love to flow, that we can love those that are hateful and unloving. That we can love those who ridicule us, persecute us, 
and speak bad about us. We can love those. Outside of God, it'll never happen. You have to have that love, that God kind of love, that, uh, that agape love, that self-sacrificing love, even for those who don't love you. You continue in my love. Verse 9 gives us that answer for being fruitful. Uh, we see that in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 when he, when he begins, the, Paul tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. And that is one fruit, and it begins with love. Paul gives us another chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It talks about love. If you, if you can do all sort of things, Paul says, if I can raise the dead and make a mountain move and talk all kind of languages and do all kind of sayings and know all the prophecies, if I don't have love, it's nothing. It's love, folks. It's love where we must put our attention. It's love that, that must just seep out of us. And that love is the love of God through Christ in us. The example uh, of the command to live in Jesus. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in me, which means uh, abide in my love, which means you will live in my love. Live in my love. Abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Living in that love. Staying connected to the, to the vine. Letting the sap flow. The love flowing from the Son, the Father, through us to others. We must remain connected. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Jesus tells us that keeping His commandments is the same as living in his love. Understanding that the word abide means living in. He further clarifies that uh, clarifies this by the statement, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. By him following the commands of the father, he maintains a life with the father. We too maintain our relationship with the father by following his commands in our lives. Jesus. Jesus is who we follow. It says <clears throat> in verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This result, this result of obedient life is joy. Joy that comes from Jesus, which in fact is his joy instilled in us. Example of the command to live in Jesus. Verse 10 and 11. So we see not only do we have that love, we end up with joy. Now joy is not always happiness. It's a difference. You can have joy and not be happy. Did you know that? Because joy is not a feeling. Joy is a knowing. Joy is knowing that one day you're going to be with Jesus for eternity. Joy is assurance and knowing that you are secure in what Jesus done and not what you do. Joy in knowing that no matter what circumstance may come my way, Jesus has it under control. Joy. That is a joy that you can't compare to happiness or being happy. Joy uh, supersedes happiness. So here's that command to live in Jesus' love. If you keep my commandments, you will live in my love, living in his love. This is, this is my commandment, that you love one another. Verse 12. The commandments are implemented. We've seen them exemplified. We've seen the examples. Here is how they are implemented. Jesus expects us to carry out his commands first to love others as as uh, <clears throat> Uh, love others as he loved us. Secondly, we uh, are to do that unselfishly. That unselfish, sacrificial love, just like Jesus showed on the cross. That's tough. The only way you can do it is through Jesus. It's not going to happen on your own or in your own power. It's not going to happen by worldly knowledge. It's going to happen by a, a relationship with Christ. And that relationship connected and vibrant and growing and continuing to move 
and expressing the love of the Father, the love of the Son, through our love and his love in us. Implementation of love as he loved us, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Think about that for a minute. How does he love you? How does he love you? I guess the greatest expression of love is shown on that thing right there. On the cross. Giving of himself completely. Sacrificially. Unselfishly. He could have. Jesus was God. Jesus is God, excuse me. Jesus is God. He could have called down legions of angels and wiped out the whole Roman government. They, they could have went into non-existence and you would have never had them in your history books. Jesus is God and he could have just spoken. All those things would have went away. But he didn't do that. He wanted us to have an expression of true love. He wanted us to see love in action. He wanted to express his love for us on that cross that we can live and, and, and model him, follow him, and do as he does. You see, he told the apostles, he says, I'm going to die, and in three days I'm going to be raised again, and I'm going back to the Father. They didn't quite comprehend all that. But you see, he gave us that assurance when he arose on the third day. He gave us the assurance and knowing that as we are connected to him, we will forever be with him in eternity, in heaven, with the Father, with the Son, all together, forever. That's our joy. That's our hope. That's, what we, that's our mainstay. So no matter what happens in this life, if we're nailed to a cross, we can have joy in knowing that we're going to soon be with Jesus. Amen? So you see, uh, we are the victors. We are more than victors. We are the conquerors. And we have this in Jesus Christ, connected to him, connected to the vine, that the sap may flow. <clears throat> uh, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Love as he loves. That is to love with all that we have. Jesus poured his life out for the people around him. Whatever the need set before him, he met it. He healed the sick, gave the blind sight, and caused the lame to walk. You see, Jesus took care of the needs around him. But you know, I remember reading a part in the Bible where he says, I couldn't do anything there. I couldn't, I couldn't help those people because they did not believe. They did not believe. And, and that is what it takes, is belief in knowing that God is going to uh, carry out what he has promised he will do to keep his commands, to keep his, what he has promised. And then we can keep what we have promised, to follow him and to trust him and to lean on him. Implementation of self-sacrificing love. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That a man would lay down his life for his friends. Hmm. Verse 14. That is self-sacrificing. That is selfless. That is giving all that you have if you will lay down your life for your friends. One's own life, one's own life for the one loved. Jesus uses the word friend, which means loved or dear. And then he says that we are his friend or love with the condition that we obey his command. You are my friends if you do what I command you. In other words, we must love in order to be loved, just like forgiving others that we can be forgiven. You see, it, there's an if-then, if-then clauses. If you do this, then this is going to happen. If you do this, then this is going to happen. We must trust him for what he says. And that brings us to the end of 
of the scripture that I was using, continue to reading on in there, you find some great truth. But how is our relationship today? How is your relationship with the Lord today? How is that? Examine yourself. If we keep the commands of the Lord, we will stay committed to our relationship with him. If not, then we are destined for a relationship collapse. If your relationship has been broken up on the reef of fear, failure or fiction, Christ Jesus here is here to mend the hull of that ship and set it afloat again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember that. Remember that. I thank you for allowing me to speak with you today and share what was on my heart. I pray that God can use what you've heard here today and implement these truths into your life and to, and to loving others as you love yourself. That's the greatest thing we can do is follow his simple command of love. So thank you. I want to pray with you for just a minute. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all your truths. And we thank you for this opportunity to share. I thank you, Father, for uh, your love demonstrated so greatly on the cross. Showing us that, that what we have is all from you. Showing us that you sacrificed it all that we can have what we need to better serve you and to love others. Father, I pray today for my brothers and sisters in this, in this group here today, in this congregation, that you will open their hearts and their minds and let them receive that love and, and let them see the the, the great need to remain connected to the vine in every instance, in every application, that we may best serve you, loving the Father with all that we have and loving our friends and neighbors as ourselves. It's all in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.